And it's a blessing to just be here with each other today, is it not? I want to acknowledge somebody very quickly, though. I didn't see. I might have had to get a new prescription or something. But uh, Sister Brittany Williams. Brittany, stand up, young lady. Amen. <laughs> Brittany is in town, and it's a good to see you. She's the leader of our anointed dance ministry, and her career now has taken off, and the Lord is blessing her in the Moving on in her career, we're so glad to see you. Amen. Amen. And we're praying for you, and we thank God for you. And may the Lord richly bless you, Brittany. Got anything to say? Amen. <laughs> Amen. God bless you. If you didn't hear, she is working in EMS, so she is experiencing the emergency issues that you never know what you're going to encounter. But I know one thing, Brittany, because the Lord is in you and he's sending you to them, they're better off. No matter what situation they may be in. And we're praying for you on all fronts. God bless you. Good to see you. We're going to begin today with the third part of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we've been dealing with the ministry of the Holy Spirit as we have celebrated our revival. The first week of this month in which our revival theme was following Jesus in prayer. And we want to continue because revival should end. But we know sometimes in our lives we go through seasons, we go through the ups and downs of living in a fallen world. And thus uh, the issue of being revived is an ongoing need for every disciple of Jesus Christ. Paul often talked about that when he was in prison, those who would come and visit him refreshed his spirit. And this is needed today as never before. So the purpose of dealing with the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to uh, educate all of us and to call us to remember that greater is he that is in us than he that's in this world. And he is our source of everything. We began in part one about the issue of we must depend more on the power of the Holy Spirit as never before. We must depend on him. As it says, those who are led by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, are the children of God. And on part two, we dealt with the issue of the Holy Spirit's ministry is to give us discernment to give us discernment. Part 2 dealt with John 3, 4, 1 through 6, 1 John 4, 1 through 6 especially, where he said, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but test the spirit, whether they are of God. And this is so critical today in the last days as Christ's return is looming, because the greatest need in each of our lives and in the church today is discernment. The ability to tell the difference between God's ways and man's ways. And, and we looked at this, this classic example in Acts 16, 6 of the slave girl who was running behind the apostles saying, these are men of the most high God who come to show us the way of salvation. And after a few days, Acts 16 following, 16, 16 following, said Paul got annoyed with the girl and discerned that what she was saying, though it was true, was motivated by an evil spirit. And that's how subtle this, this deception is out there, my brothers and sisters, that the enemy can even speak the truth but have a wrong spirit. And we must be so discerning 
that even when we hear the, the enemy speaking truth, we can still spot the enemy. This is critical for our families, for our children, for our grandchildren, for the future of the church and the pathway of the church to stay on course. We must be even more discerning. And if we're going to be discerning, it will be because we love the truth. I was talking to Renee this week as we were just talking about the message, as we normally do. And she always is my sounding board, if you want to say. Um, but she's very graceful with me. <laughs> and uh, we were talking about discernment this week. And... I believe I remember saying that we got to love the truth. Now, hear this, hear this very well before I go to part three. If you're not putting truth in your head, if you're not putting truth in your mind, you won't have no discernment. Because if you're putting things that are not true in your mind, that short circuits discernment. The only reason we can be discerning and tell the difference between God's ways and man is because we're putting God's truth in our mind. And this is the key, brothers and sisters. It's not rocket science. Jesus said, if you abide in my word, if you remain, if you're constantly in it, you will know the truth. And what is the result? The truth will continue to keep setting you free. And that's what we need in these last days. The freedom that the Spirit of God provides in our lives. The freedom to live right. The freedom to love our neighbors. The freedom to do everything God wants us to do. The freedom to obey his law. And this last point before I go to the third part. We said the Holy Spirit works in our lives imperceptibly. Meaning we don't know how he's working. We don't understand how he's working. We couldn't tell a person, you know, let me tell you how he's working in my life. Because John said that the Holy Spirit is like the wind. He blows, he, he comes, you know, you can't see the wind, you can't harness the wind, you can't grab it, you can't keep it, but he lives in us and works in us imperceptibly, meaning we can't tell he's doing what he's doing. We can't perceptibly tell it. Sometimes we try to use our emotions to See whether the Holy Spirit is moving or whatever. But they're not the, the most, they're not the reliable uh, variable to use. Because he's moving and working no matter how you feel. No matter how I feel. When I got in this pulpit today, he was working. He was moving. It didn't matter how I felt though. Matter of fact, do feel a lot better. But, but all I'm saying is, we can't understand how he's working in our life, but we can see the evidence of it. We can see the fruit he produces. We can say that I don't know how he did it, but I know I feel his peace. I don't know how it happens, but I know I'm being sustained in this trial. I don't know how it happened, but I know I'm back in service after going through medical challenges. We don't know how he is beyond us. The divine work of the Holy Spirit is beyond our mental capacity to understand. But we do see the evidence of it. Is that right? And so today I want to go just a little further 
in part three, if you don't mind. I want to deal with today the part of the ministry of the Holy Spirit that continues to set us free. Freedom. Being free. The Holy Spirit ministry is to help us walk in freedom. Freedom. Everybody wants to be free. Free today. That's the big word today. I'm free. Free, free, free. But the issue is free to what? For some people, their freedom is bondage. Especially those who don't know Christ as we once did. We used to thought freedom was to go to the club when we wanted to. Freedom was to spend our money the way we wanted to. Freedom was to go wherever we wanted to. We used to think that was freedom before we met the Lord, did we not? Freedom was for me to do whatever I want to do. That was freedom to us. But after we met the Savior, we found out that freedom was really bondage. Because in the sense of the unnatural, the world's understanding of freedom is really bondage. They're not free to love their neighbor, free to forgive, free to bless people, free to go home at night. Free not to do this and do that. And whenever we can't choose to do what God wants, we're not free. We are bound. And even in a Christian's life, if we don't understand the ministry of the Holy Spirit, we can choose bondage. That's why the scripture says, don't use your freedom in Christ for a cloak of bondage. Because we still have a choice. And I want to deal with it today if you don't mind. The scriptures that I've been wrestling with are so many, I decided not to put them in the program. So, <laughs> so you're going to get assorted scriptures today. So make sure you got your pen out. I'm watching you. You pull up that program we got. And you write in that section we have provided. So when you go home, you can meditate on these scriptures. I know you will. And so we want to deal with today the ministry of the Holy Spirit as it relates to freedom. I want to begin by lifting a scripture from Galatians 5.1, which says it was, and I'm reading from the New American Standard, it was for freedom that Christ has set us free. It was for freedom that Christ has set us free. Keep standing firm and do not be subject again to the yoke of bondage or the yoke of slavery as one translation says it was for freedom Paul says that Christ set us free therefore keep standing firm and do not be subject to the yoke of bondage or slavery if Galatians 5.1 is here we begin to understand that the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to help us walk in spiritual freedom. Spiritual freedom. And, and you know, in thinking about that issue of spiritual freedom, this is why Christ came. The death and resurrection of Jesus Christ accomplished for every Christian disciple what no one or nothing else could ever do as it relates to to freedom from sin and as it relates to walking in your salvation. Jesus' death and resurrection was, has forgiven, has forgiven us 
and freed us, get this church, from the tyranny of sin. Tyranny comes from a word that is related to the word tyrant. A tyrant is somebody who stands over somebody and makes them do what they don't want to do or makes them do whatever they do. And when we were outside of the body of Christ, we were under the tyranny of sin. We couldn't do nothing but sin. Sin was the product of our lives. Because we were sinful by nature, right? But Christ's death on the cross and resurrection from the dead broke the tyranny of sin. It broke the tyranny of sin. And now we can say, I don't have to do that anymore. And we have the power to walk away. Is that right? Yes, it's true. Sin no longer has the power to dominate our lives because Jesus defeated Satan on the cross. And his resurrection from the dead validated an eternal victory. The victory was to set us free from the tyranny of sin's power. This is one of the greatest truths of the Christian faith. The truth is that Christians have been saved and set free. But the question needs to be raised in 2019, set free for what purpose? What am I now free to be and to do? How is this freedom practically seen in my walk with Christ? Where will this freedom lead me? And I submit to you that this issue of freedom in Christ, even today, even in the church today, is being sabotaged by false teaching. In the church, that Satan sins to deceive us and sabotage our freedom. Because anything will lead us back to sin. And being taught in the church that says sin is compatible with the Christian life is leading us back to bondage. See, 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 this is the issue. We've been set free from sin. Not set free to sin, but set free from sin. Can I go just a little further? False teaching that is leading even some Christians back into bondage, though they don't even know it. Don't even recognize they're in bondage. Amen. I don't mean you don't go through stuff, church. But I'm talking about going back to the hog pen. Back in the bondage of our flesh. And get this, empty religious activity. This is why the Apostle Paul exhorted the churches of Galatia to stand fast in the freedom wherewith Christ has set us free. Because in Galatia, there were the Judaizers, remember? Those who were trying to take those coming out of the areas of Galatia, the region of Galatia, who were being saved, they were trying to then say to them, well, if you're going to really be saved, you got to go back and do this. And what was it they were saying you had to do? Well, in your leisure today, read the fourth chapter of Galatians. And you'll see, you had to be what? Circumcised. You had to keep obeying the Jewish customs and laws. And you know what? I thought he said we were saved by grace. Through faith. That not of yourselves. Not of works. It's a gift of God. But yet there's always an imitation spirit, a false spirit, imitating the Holy Spirit, even using the Bible, misquoting the Bible, misinterpreting the Bible, and then leading people in the church back into bondage. 
So we want to see that the true ministry of the Holy Spirit leads to freedom. The churches of Galatia had been infiltrated by these false teachers who at the heart were legalists. That's what they were. They were trying to promote legalism. Legalism is trying to obey the law in order to be saved. That's a legalist. This is what Jesus ran into with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious leaders of his time. They were legalists to the core. They were so legalistic, they would even tithe their plants. The plants that grow in their gardens. They would bring a tenth of it to the temple. But the fallacy of it was, they thought that's what made them right with God. So self works, right? Legalism is not the Holy Spirit working. Legalism is self working, trying to be right with God. This would mean then, if you were a legalist, that Jesus' in death and resurrection plus your works are necessary for salvation. Last time I checked the hymn said Jesus paid it all. Amen. All to him I owe. Amen. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it. I didn't have no detergent for my sin. He washed it. He blood shed for me. His blood, not mine. He. So if we take the legalist approach, the Imitation religious spirit approach, it would mean that the death and resurrection plus works are necessary for salvation. This would mean that a person must depend on their own religious righteous acts for salvation. In addition to what Christ did on the cross. Maybe today some of us could be perplexed or confused about living the Christian life. You're feeling guilty because you didn't cross every T and dot every I. Maybe the enemy is putting the guilt trip on you because you know you didn't do what you were supposed to do or you disobeyed God. Well, let me tell you something. If you have fallen into any category, let me tell you something. If you are a true child of God, all you got to do, confess your sin. And he is faithful and just to forgive you. And to keep on what? Cleansing us from all unrighteousness. See, that's what the Holy Spirit will tell you to do. Confess. Holy Spirit won't tell you to run away. He'll tell you to come closer. Because the only way to deal with it is to confess it if you belong to him. Now, now the false spirit will make you think, well, well, I'll do better. What I'll do is I won't confess. I'll just pick up the pace in another area of my life. I, I'll just start doing more over here, even though I ain't dealt with what I left right there. And thus you get into this perplexed, this discombobulation because you're listening to the wrong spirit instead of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit always will bring you to confession and repentance and bless his name. Restoration. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Remember Judas went out and hung himself. Peter went out and confessed got forgiven and restored. Like I say, maybe today some of us are confused about this Christian living, this freedom. And you're seeking to add sincere works of religious activity to your life in order to have assurance about your salvation. Let me tell you, that's a way to bondage. Your assurance and your eternal security Ain't got nothing to do with what you're doing. Amen. 
Let me say something to you. Your eternal security is because of what he's doing right now. And what the Holy Spirit is doing in you. Jesus said, all that the Father will give me, they will come to me. And in no way will I cast them out. No one will pluck them out of my hand. I will never leave you or forsake you. You got to remember that the Holy Spirit is in us to assure us, assure us to know that we are here. Romans 8, 16 puts it this way. The Holy Spirit bears witness with my spirit that I'm a child of God. This is the internal witness. This is the internal, eternal security. And, and let me say this again. I said it in message two or one or two. The Holy Spirit don't leave a true Christian. See, see, there's a misunderstanding about the Holy Spirit that he leaves you. You know, this is the quote they use. He won't dwell in an unclean vessel. Well, if he's in you, he didn't clean you up. That's the point. If he's in you, he doesn't clean you up. You already been forgiven. You already been washed. You already been blessed. You are beloved of God. You are his child. You have been sealed according to Ephesians 1.13. And he is the down payment of the eternal possession that you're going to get in eternity. When we get the wrong spirit teaching in the church, he'll always lead you to legalism. It will. But he, the Holy Spirit, will assure you. This means then well, we must depend on the soul work of Christ alone at the cross to save us, right? And we must also understand that our works are now done through dependence on the power of the Holy Spirit alone. I do what I do now not to be saved, but because the Holy Spirit has freed me to begin to serve God acceptably. We can take no credit or praise for anything because it is the Holy Spirit who's within us who has freed and enabled us to grow and to serve. My brothers and sisters, watch out for legalism. Legalism, thinking you're right with God because we gave him money today. Or because I'm standing in a pulpit preaching today. Or any work we do. No, that ain't what does it. It's what the Holy Spirit has done in his regenerating power to save us. Now, let me give you a scripture on that. Go to Titus. Titus chapter 3. This is important as you talk about the freedom to live for Christ. This is where it begins. Now. This is the initiation of being set free. And then I'm going to give you some more scriptures. Can I get amen? amen. <laughs> Titus 3.3. 3. And I want you to be encouraged today, church, because the Holy Spirit's working in your life. And in many of our lives, been working for many, many years. And as we go down the last stretch before Christ returns, we want him to use us more and more. Titus 3, Titus is after 2 Timothy 3.3. 3. It says here, I'm reading from the New King James now, for we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. We can all say amen. amen. But, hallelujah, but, verse 4, <laughs> when the kindness, thank you, Lord, and the love of God our Savior toward man appear. Now here it is. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy. According to what? His mercy. His mercy on us. He saved us. 
Who did it? He did. But how did he do it? Look at the rest of the verse. Through the washing. It says washing. That means something had to be cleaned up. Through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. There it is right there. That's how you got saved. When you believed on Jesus Christ. What was the agent that effectively brought it to pass? It was he, the Holy Spirit, who came in, who washed us, cleansed us, regenerated us. Not only that, is renewing us. You see it? Whom he poured out on us abundantly. Abundantly. Through who? Jesus Christ. Therefore, having been justified by his grace, we have become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. You know how I translate that? Mike Smith been set free. Been set free by the Spirit of God. And the same Holy Spirit who lives in us today wants to continue to effectively work in this freedom we have. But we got to beware of the false spirit, of a religious spirit, of a traditional spirit, of a spirit in the midst of the church that's not of God that will imitate the Holy Spirit. But the end of following that is bondage. That's the person who can't stop sinning but goes to church. Can't stop sinning though. That's what the Bible says. Ever learn it. But can't get set free from the truth. By the truth. This is a reality in the church. Come on Sunday. Bound up all week long. Because of a deceptive spirit. Well, I won't be able to finish this one today. I can see that. But I hope you hear what I'm saying. But just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. Just a little bit. <laughs> too, but amen. I want you to go to Romans chapter 6. Because this is where we're going to stay for a week or two. And go into part 4. And, and, you know, if you really want to see the ministry of the Holy Spirit as he practically works, you got to read Romans 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. <laughs> got to read it. Got to read it. Amen. You can't nibble on it. You got to eat it. But I'm just going I'm to I'm gonna slice it. At Romans 6. Because my brothers and sisters. You know where you are in Christ. I know where I am in Christ. You know what's dealing, what you're dealing with in your life. I'm just here to tell you today pastorally. If you're in Christ. You are set free. You're set free. If you're in Christ. You're free. And it's like the illustration of that old bulldog. You know when me and my brother were growing up on Davies Street. We had a few dogs along the way. We had one called Champ, one called Whitey. I ain't going to tell you what we really called him. <laughs> we were bound up. <laughs> Amen. Amen. But we always had to put a chain on the dog in the backyard. Chain. You know, he can go but so far. And, you know, after a while, he didn't tow up all the grass and it's just dirt in the area where he could go. But you could come in there at a day of time and take that chain off that dog. And he wouldn't go no further than what he was used to going. Even though he had been set free. And see, this is what's happening in Christians' lives. We don't realize just how free you've been set free from. And for us, it's so amazing. This grace is so amazing. That, but we, don't, we won't go too far. We won't go too far in our faith. We won't go no further than where we've been. We, 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 we can go as far as we want to go. But we'll just stay over there where we're used to going. I'm here to tell you today, you've been set free. You can go where you haven't been before if you walk in the Spirit. Don't limit yourself to the front porch. Come on, 
down, get on the sidewalk. And let's walk down the street. Let's go down into a new neighborhood. Let's go where we haven't been before. You've been set free. Romans 6, 1, I'm just going to introduce this and then I'm going to try to quit. And I'm reading this from the New Living Translation for amplification. Verse 6, verse 1, chapter 6, verse 1, Romans 6, 1. Well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? The answer is, of course not. Here it is, church. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when you, we were joined with Christ in Jesus, Jesus Christ in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead, by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Since we have been united with him in his death, we also be raised to life as he was. Verse 6 is a key verse. Verse 6, key verse. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power. In our life. See, this is the point. The power, the chain has been broken. That's why I can do what I didn't do before. Because I have been broken. I've been freed from the power or the tyranny of sin. We've been freed from its power. You got to remember that it no longer has the power over us it used to. Because Jesus' death and resurrection broke it. It broke what Satan had us bound under. He defeated Satan on the cross and Satan's power was broken over those who believe. Verse 6 again. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power. Now we'll never get away from the presence of sin in this fallen world. But the power does no longer rule us. Amen. Now listen, I'm going to say that again because I want to hear more than Renee say amen. The power has been broken. And I don't have to do that anymore. Look at rest of verse 6. We are no longer slaves to sin slave is somebody who's in bondage we're no longer in bondage to sin for when we died with Christ we were set free from the power of sin and since we died with Christ we also know we will live with him we are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead and he will never die again death no longer has any power over him when he died he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. Verse 11, so you and I should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. I can walk by faith and not by sight. I don't have to do what I used to do no more because I've been set free. I thank God for the ministry of the Holy Spirit who's in us, who continually wants us to walk in more freedom. And so verse 12 says, don't let sin control you the way you live. Don't give in to its sinful desires. I can make a choice now. I ain't got to say I made a mistake. I ain't got to say that no more. I don't have to say that anymore. Um, I don't have to make excuses. I don't have to compromise. I can live for Christ. 
And I'm, I want you to be encouraged today, church. So I'm going to end with this last verses 13 and 14. I ain't even got to the good part yet. But verse 13, don't not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. They're talking about using our bodies. We've been set free, so I got to use my body the right way now. Instead, give yourself completely to God. For you were dead, but now you have a new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right. For the glory of God. Sin is no longer your master. For you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead you live under the freedom of God's grace. How about a few hallelujahs? I don't know about you. But I'm free right now. Amen. Attack will come. The enemy will oppress us. He will attack us and get us discombobulated. But when we get into this book and hear what God's words say and understand the ministry of the Holy Spirit, he'll set us free. Free, I tell you. Free. Free. Free, free.